you know, I was on a ride over uh, to the studio this morning, um, dropping my son off at daycare. It's on the way to the studio, and um, we're playing country music. He likes to listen to, to country music in the morning, and um, we're playing this song, one of my favorites, uh, Grandpa by Dave Fenley. And um, that song just does such a great job of putting into perspective where we're at in the world right now um the longing for you know yesterday and um you know the simpler times maybe when our grandfathers uh were growing up and you know uh, this like this 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 song is the first time i i see my son actually like listening to music and feeling something from the music which that's what that's why I love music. That's uh, music. Music and hunting in that same way are they draw out emotions and you you feel you feel something that um, you otherwise otherwise wouldn't if you're not listening to music or if you're not out hunting. You don't get those to experience that. And you know we've listened to music. We've my son and I will uh, you know turn on YouTube and you know dance to you know kids songs and things like that. Um, and just you know have fun that way but this was the first time I, I saw him actually listening to the music and you know he's he loves this song and he just goes all of a sudden after the the second verse he goes he goes daddy i want to talk to my other grandpa so we he lives with his uh one of his grandpas um so he sees him and talks to him every day but listening to the song letting those lyrics, you know, feel he's feeling. And obviously he doesn't know what all of them mean, but he knows they're talking about grandpa and it's such a great moving song. And he says, um, I want to talk to my other grandpa. So we called him and, uh, it just, it just made me a little bit emotional one because I love music a lot. And, uh, I saw that it actually affected my son for the first time. Um, then it was just touching that he, you know, wanted to talk to his grandpa. We've got the technology to make that happen right away in the car. Um, and uh just made made me happy made me think about life a little bit um how we got to cherish every moment that we have um and it really just like it it reminded me why why the at the core why we go out and hunt it's making memories with your family um and friends some people don't grow up in a hunting family but it's making memories with your family it's making you know that same thing that i felt this morning watching my son react to that song and want to talk to his grandpa and talking to him it's that and whatever that feeling is um that comes out when you're hunting too and uh <clears throat> yeah i just I, I that's that's at the core why we why we do this um that's why it makes me feel good to continue to do hunt suburbia bring podcasts to people i know it's changing people's lives it's helping them hunt stock uh, you know makes connections for people um that i don't even know about i mean there's a lot that i do know about great connections that were made people went on hunting trips together people who are now good friends because of it and i was uh i was talking with uh ron boucher goes by bushy in vermont he's um a legendary Boone and Crockett scorer, one of the most renowned, uh, you know, scorers um, in United United States. Really, I mean, if you if you break it down, he's he's a legendary deer scorer. He scored the Milo Hansen buck on a panel score. He uh, scored the Johnny King buck. He scored the Fulton buck. Um, you know, he's been around the block. He's great great friends with Larry Benoit great friends with milo for a while um we've we've been talking a lot me and ron because um i'm going up actually to vermont for total archery challenge this weekend and uh we're doing a podcast uh at ron's place where we're gonna go into uh you know the saga that is the milo hansen buck and him score getting to score that buck and where that where that happenstance you know how he got into it we're gonna we're gonna dive into it but it brought him down this path in life that he had no idea he was gonna go or ever dreamed uh to be going down that path but one little thing can change so many people's 
lives. And uh, he told me, he, he said, look, Pat, you don't understand what you're doing yet with Huntstock and how many people's lives are being changed and how many of those paths you might be starting for people um, who just go to your show and make connections and have great times. But you, by, by building this awesome show, it's making and giving people the opportunity to just do what we love and get together and connect and um, learn from legends, meet legends, meet other like-minded hunters, maybe meeting your new hunting buddy. He said, you don't, you know, you don't really realize it. And, uh, but you are changing people's lives. And again, that at the core is what is so freaking fun about coming in to work every day now. Um, in this studio that we put up to remind, you know, give us a, a, a sense of being in a deer camp. I want to work in a place where, you know, even these walls bring out the emotions a little bit of a deer camp. Um, now it's not the same as being in a real deer camp. It's not the same as, uh, actually <laughs> hunting with your buddies and, and your family, but at least it, uh, it satiates that that need a little bit. And, um, so e even just being in here brings out, you know, that great feeling that, uh, is really the driving force behind all of this. Um, and, it, and this for people watching, um, and, and who listen all the time, you might think like, Oh man, it looks like he's spending a lot of, a lot of money on, uh, on renovating and, you know, we just announced fifty six hundred dollars in in prizes for the archery games at Huntstock, and um, yeah, dude, we are taking every bit of money from Huntstock, and it's not a lot, by the way, but we're taking every bit of it and putting it back into the event. I'm sacrificing years and years of salary of a good job that I had, and I left it to do this, um, and. Uh, I'm blessed to be in the position to be able to do that. I've got a wife that makes a good living. I've got in-laws that live with us and help with the kids so that I can pour every hour of my work week into building something like Huntstock so that we all can just celebrate what we love so much, man. And I don't know. It was listening to the, that music, uh, listening to, to that song with my boy, and then um, some more country. Something about country, dude. I love all kinds of music. But country music really t it, it tugs at that, you know, that primal, that same string, like I said, that hunting does. Uh, you feel it when you listen to a good country song. And um, it's motivating me this morning to look for some, uh, you know, we, we don't have a ton of budget for musicians. Actually, pretty pretty much stretched thin on, on budget. I mean, to peel back the curtain... Uh, I think we're up to eighty thousand dollars in expenses already on this year's hunt stock because we're bringing you guys um, a bunch of awesome stuff. Uh, it costs money to get get people there, Airbnbs, the venue, um, branding, getting lanyards printed up, maps, oh, all that stuff, man. It's all it all adds up, um, and I think you know most people wouldn't. Most people would just keep expenses really, really low, um, keep the event at a at a base level, and uh, and try to put you know more money in their pockets. But we are Pat Burns and I talk about it a lot. It's uh, and 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 I love it. it's from this movie Air that just came out about Michael Jordan and the the Nike deal that that they did that uh, changed the landscape of sports in 1984 and. Uh, if you just look at the the original principles of Nike in 1984, there's a list of it. You can find it online, and um, they just go through their business principles and motto. And one of them that uh, that is just it's awesome. It's the same philosophy that uh, I've been talking to Pat about, and what I learned basically from Spartan Race, and you know, more so than learning what to do, you learn what not to do when you have an experience. Um, at a company that was fast growing and, and, uh, what I learned not to do is so valuable, um, that basically I went back to my instincts with, uh, with, with events and it's just make the experience incredible. 
raise the expenses. I, we don't care. You don't even think about profits in the first few years of an event. You know, down the line, if we do everything right in these in these first three, four, five years, you do everything right. Um, you just elevate the experience. You meet, you you go the extra mile to make something happen that uh, kind of seems like it would be impossible or no one's done it before. And if you go that extra mile and you live on the edge of of what's possible and what's impossible, that's where you're going to force innovation. And this Nike principle on there says if we – and it might not be verbatim, but if we do things right, we'll make money damn near automatic. And that's just a good philosophy for anybody in any line of business. I know Reedy's does this. Um, you look at anybody who uh, is, you know, the top of their field, whatever it may be. And I, I've thought about this recently with Reedy's. It's it, uh, Reedy's has, you know, should have that on the wall too because they do everything right. When you go in as a customer, um, you are treated right. You're treated with respect. If you buy a bow in their shop, um, you get, you know, they'll work on it as long as you keep coming back to their shop and, and they're, they're, they're your go-to people, they're going to take care of you. They're going to repair your bows. They'll get you a bow in your hand if something happens right before hunting season. And they just do things right. And that is why they're such a successful archery shop. And I want to use that same type of philosophy. And that's what we're doing at Huntstock. We're just trying to do things right. And yeah, in the future, it would be nice to make some money off of it. Four or five years down the road, then we'll make some money off of it. But in the and you know, it's we're gonna make a little bit of money off of it every year too. We need we need to uh, support our families, but most of the money is going right back into the event to do things right and make sure that we continue to do things right and live on that line of of innovation. And um, I just. So, so, so it's listening to, to this song and, and, uh, getting a little bit emotional this morning on the way over here, um, just motivated me to, um, um, uh, look for some bands, um, country singers, acoustic players. Um, I'd like to have a bluegrass band. And, um, if anybody who's listening wants to be a part of the live music part of Huntstock and, you can you help you you want to help believe in this uh this vision that we got and do things right the atmosphere on on friday night saturday night when the festival winds down and the after party starts up um if you want to uh take this as an opportunity and uh you you want to play some music that's from the heart that is going to touch people in that same spot that that hunting does um hit me up because we uh we want to build that music side of the festival. I don't, this year we don't have hardly anything left, left in the budget for something like that. So if you want to come do it for fun and, and play for tips, you know, people at Huntstock are amazing people. Um, I think you're, you, you'll make a ton of money off of tips anyway, but um, don't think about it uh, on the money side, do things right. The money's going to come. Um, so if anybody wants to play, let me know. This week, I'm joined by Justin Thibodeau and Mark Matthew coming down from southern Maine uh, all the way down here to the podcast studio. Uh, appreciate these fellas making the trip down. They're uh, some big buck killers. Um, Justin, uh, I think he said he's killed a dozen or so in the 140s. And uh, his biggest is uh, in the high 150s, um, as well as, you know, countless, uh, you know, uh, smaller than, than 140, but good bucks. And Mark, uh, very similarly as well, has got a couple in the 150s, for, 140s range. Um, uh, and by a couple, I think, I mean uh, double digits as well. So these guys, they hunt differently. Um, they are, are both really successful in how they hunt. Um, there's some great, uh, tactics being brought up that, uh, we touch on some things. I don't think, uh, we've, we've mentioned on the podcast at all in previous years. So make sure you listen to this one all the way through. Um, we get into some really, uh, you know, just, Justin is about 
as uh, aggressive as you can get as a deer hunter and a caller. Um, so he shares his thoughts and how he's been successful aggressively calling, like calling almost all the time, uh, all day, um, during at least a couple of weeks, uh, during the season and, and moving from spot to spot. Um, you know, and, uh, it's just, it's just really neat how he, how he talks about it. Um, and, uh, same thing with Mark, he's got some great insight on picking great stand locations. Uh, he does some calling as well. Um, and, and scouting throughout the, uh, the winter time, but these guys get on big deer, they live for deer hunting. Um, and there's a, there's a ton of stuff to take away from this one. So without further ado, let's get into, uh, this podcast here with Justin Thibodeau and Mark Matthew. All right, we got another episode of the Hunt Suburbia podcast, and today I'm joined by uh, two guys that drove down from Maine, Justin Thibodeau and Mark Matthew, Matthew. correct? Matthew. Yep. Okay. Um, how was the drive down, boys? Uh, it wasn't too bad. Um, it was pretty smooth, I'd say, till we got... Traffic picked up as we got closer. Yeah, about a half hour from this, this area, we had a little bit of traffic, but other than that, it wasn't bad at all. How, uh, how is this area compared to where, where you guys live? As far as what? Like yeah, well, population-wise? Yeah, what, do you, what did you notice? Did much you, more developed. You, actually, the, fir- <laughs> the first thing, what did I say to you when we just pulled in? Uh, the first thing I said to him is, I don't know how anyone could stand living here all the time. <laughs> and no offense to you. Yeah. I'm just so used to living where we live. But <clears throat> at the same time, I have a military background. So I've been stationed. I was stationed in Queens, New York for three years. So I do know what it's like to live in, you know, very populated areas, um, but it's just not my cup of tea. Feel a little claustrophobic, <laughs> you know, when you live in areas like that. Yeah, because yeah, within 10, 15 minutes, we can be on a dirt road where we live. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I love dirt roads. You know, it, part of the reason I built this <clears throat> studio, too, we were talking about before we recorded it was because I don't, I'm like you, I don't, I don't really, this wouldn't be my preferred place to live if life, you know, happened a different way. Yep. I always saw myself living in Vermont or New Hampshire or Maine, up in bigger woods. Um, you but plenty of time. Plenty of time. And dude, again, I, like, I've come to find out that the deer hunting is pretty good around the suburb. It's different. It's definitely different, but it's pretty good. They're, I've got 25 mature bucks on camera that I have identified that are within five miles of where I live that are all nice. They're all like that one or bigger and, you know, 125 inch plus deer and having a whole bunch like that ready, you know, in within the vicinity is exciting. Um, I love going to Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire and hunting big woods too. And like we were talking, taking woodman arms out, muzzleloader hunting, rifle hunting, but it is, there is something fun about figuring out the suburbs too. Absolutely. <laughs> and honestly, I mean, where we live is, is not big woods. It's, it's just like, like here yep i mean it's tight there's a lot of small area um you know bow hunting and stuff i deal with that all the time i have a ton of big bucks on camera and there's there's virtually no other hunters but i mean i could be in my um climber and watch a sports sporting game on somebody's tv from (laughs) from my climber really yeah so you guys you guys do some suburban style hunting and also big Big, yeah yeah big time it's we have a mix of both i mean it's where we particularly live, it's pretty tight knit, but I can drive <clears throat> ten minutes, you know, ten minutes away and be in big woods. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Not like northern Maine big woods, but big enough where I can hunt all day and not yeah, see you, anybody or anything. But you won't see another hunter. No. Yep. It's like I was just I was telling Mark when you when you're in the bathroom downstairs, uh Pat Burns and I were scouting um, a couple places. We went to the, the Big Woods Bucks, Spring Thaw, and Jackman, and I love it way up there, too. But then we drove. We wanted to do some shed hunting, so we drove just south. There was still too much snow up there. You couldn't really get in anywhere unless you were on a um, – unless you went to a deer yard and you were walking along, you know, their beaten down path. So we were like, hey, let's, let's just drive south until we get out of the snow zone and there's some open ground that we can do some shed hunting and some scouting. So we did that, and it was a couple hours south of Jackman in areas like you're describing it's not big big woods like the the north north main woods right. are but i mean there's still five thousand acre patches exactly. ten thousand acre patches and those are those are big yeah. that's and and it felt awesome we saw some great deer sign found a a nice deadhead that uh, we'll get up in this studio at some point but 
Yeah, I love. I I fell in love with that. I can't wait to go back and hunt that particular area too. Um, so yeah. So are you guys in? So it's Southern Maine. We don't have to get specifics, but Southern Maine, right? Yep. Um. Yeah, we're right on the New Hampshire border, pretty much. Is where, it? In, are you in the early bow zone? Yes. Yep. Yeah, it's September seventh or something around that time frame. Um, expanded, which is the coastal area, um, and I I've been hunting that for probably 17 years or so now it's actually one of my favorite parts of hunting is the expanded time frame yeah just you get to get out there before anyone else you you rarely see people i mean depending where you go you could park on one road and there could be 20 trucks on that road but if you have um permission spots and um you know areas to go <clears throat> you could have several mature deer at your own grasp you know what i mean i i there's many times where I've had a camera out and I've had 15 to 20 different big bucks. And, and a lot of times, it's so early, they're still together. Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't recall a time I shot a 145-inch eight-pointer. I mean, a giant, and he had four other deer of the same caliber with him. It's like, which one do I take? Yeah. You know what I mean? And I ended up waiting for the last one, which was a bigger one. And, uh, yeah, I just I enjoy the expanded. So that it's, it's that is time. what's fun about the early season is um, that they can still be in their bachelor groups and uh, and they oftentimes are and they can be in their summer you know still in their summer pattern so yep. you can you can get you you know a lot of people say it's the best time to kill a big buck is the early, early early because they're still in the summer pattern so you, yep. you can figure yeah, out going from bed. feeding to bedding yep well, they seem to be a lot more relaxed too the whole the whole you know, <clears throat> mindset changes on them and it, it changes quick too i mean it's usually the first two weeks that it's like that once i start hitting week three it's like i start seeing very limited but a few scrapes pop up here and there and then their whole attitude changes with each other and with their you know posture towards the things around them you yeah know? yeah oh yeah and sometimes it's funny too you'll have uh the scrapes will open up like real early and they're just all of a sudden you walk into a place and you're like holy there must be a bunch of bucks in here or just one super aggressive one, buck yeah, and you one just went, see it yeah one went crazy up. um yeah i wonder how if if the you know first <clears throat> frost or a cold you know kind of cold like we'll uh we'll get them into that or what what makes it year to year because last year i did not see early scrapes around here but the year before that one place was absolutely ripped up by September 1st. I mean, it was... I think it's dough ratio, and, and I think it's just time frame. Because, I mean, I've seen it happen when it's still 90 degrees out, you know? And then I've seen it happen when it's cold, and I've seen it ha not happen, you know, when it's freezing out, too. Yeah. So I think it just depends on the dough ratio. I, I don't really know. I mean, other than that, I'm just looking for the sign. When it's there, it's there. When it's not, it's not, but... I'm no biologist. <laughs> uh, and I've noticed, too, in the last couple of years, we haven't had a very good acorn crop. Yeah. So if they're revolving around food source, they're either traveling or finding something else. Yeah, and it's just like turkey hunting. You know, the <clears throat> the toms are obviously going to be where the hens are. Bucks are going to be where the does are. So if the, the food crop, like he's saying, isn't going to be great in an area and the does have moved, then obviously your bucks are going to be moving, too. So. Yeah. It's just yeah, and that makes sense too because that's what happened last year. That spot, you know, two years ago it was loaded with acorns, um, and last year it really wasn't. And I also noticed a couple other hunter stands moved in. That, that two years ago I was the only hunter in that spot, and then this last year I noticed a couple stands pop up. Um, so maybe a combination of that and just no food there, and the, the sign wasn't there, so I hunted elsewhere. But I, I love doing that because then you get to expand your territory, find a new spot, absolutely, add more, add more places to your inventory of where you can go. Yeah, it's one of my favorite things. I love traveling around and finding new hunting spots. I mean, it's just the adventure about it is great. I think a lot of people underestimate the water table too. You know, you can have a good food mass crop year, but if the water is not the way it's supposed to be, mm -hmm. that can change the way deer's patterns are as well. Did you guys have the drought last year too? <clears throat> yeah, 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 we yeah. did, and, and, and it affected a lot of the spots I had. You know, very dry, super dry, and that that particular spot I'm talking about too was a swamp. So I don't know, um, the edge of a big big swamp. So I don't know if the and maybe you know i would think in my head that that would draw keep deer there because the swamp would be the last place to lose all of their 
you know, all of their right, water. Right, be, be a source to drink a little bit. And yeah. Cool down and whatnot. But. but it must have been the acorns. So how did you guys meet, and what's your what's your history and your story? Do you guys have a group called New England Buck Reapers? <clears throat> but how did you guys how did you guys meet and? Uh, so Buck Reapers was actually created by another buddy of mine, Nate Fenderson. Um, we all we all hunt, you know, separate of each other. Um, we just we, we utilize that group as a team thing and more from com- camaraderie purposes and stuff. But it's mostly uh, Nate Fenderson's, you know, kind of that's kind of his thing. Um, yep. We do use the name. It's, it's and just a we all cool live like within a, a mile or two of each other. Yeah. So, it's just like a club that he started, and you guys yeah. are part of the team, and yeah, you guys are brothers and have fun he, hunting. He started and that name in like 2009 or something, but I've known him, you know, longer than that, and just, we hunt together anyway, so we just decided, you know, he decided that uh, we might as well all just wear hats and stuff like that. It's not a, it's not a huge thing. I yeah. mean, we just, uh, it's just something we do. Yep. Um, it's like a, a discombobulated deer camp, kind of, like you kinda. guys all belong to a deer camp, but without the singular roof over your head yeah i mean yeah. we haven't put in too too much into it we you know we, we got all the gear and all that stuff and you know we planned to set up last year um at hunt stock and we just we all had some personal issues occur that you know we kind of ruined dampered that um yep we're looking to try to still do something this year we're hoping we'll talk more about that later yeah dude you guys are in i mean um, you can make it let's do it but uh as far as so hunting wise, my dad is the one who got me into hunting. Uh, he was huge into hunting, and I sat beside him like, every day. He went out; I was there. I was like his third leg, you know. In Maine, when when I was younger, growing up in Maine, anyone under ten could not carry a gun. Now, it's any age as long as you're you know you can sh- you can fire it, you can you can use it. But when it was yeah, with a <clears throat> when, when I shape. was younger. Huh. I couldn't carry a firearm. So I sat with my dad all the time. Everywhere he went, I went, watched him shoot deer. I mean, I was right here. We had bucks come out, and I watched him do it all, and it just it really fired me up. And he introduced me to a group of guys um, where I hang out every year. Uh, we call it The Barn. It's a buddy of mine. His name's Dave Bouchard. And he's got um, – it's, it's a barn attached to his house, and yep. we all hang our deer there. Whether we're hunting together or not, everyone brings their deer there at the end of the day, and we hang them all, and they stay there for a few days. You know, we have beers, and we talk about hunting stories. It's yeah. like it's like a camp in in southern Maine, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's something I grew up doing since I was probably six or seven years old. And once I was 10, my dad put a gun in my hand, and that's where it all took off from there. And... I became friends with a lot of my dad's friends, whom I'm still really good friends with today, and I still hunt with today. Um, my dad no longer hunts. He can't anymore. And I kind of carried on that legacy, and I hunt with all these guys. And, you know, when I say hunt with them, we're not side by side, but we do our own things. But, again, at the end of the day, you know, we bring those deer, and we talk about stories. And sometimes we are together, like... Uh, Last year, I shot uh, an eight-pointer, and I had one of my best friends, Billy, um, plant beside me. He was maybe 60 yards away, and that was the third buck he had been right within, you know, 60 yards of me last year. It was the third one, and he, uh, when I called him, I'm like, I mean, not, you know, pretty decent buck down. Was that bow or, or No, gun? that was gun. Isn't um, it fun, yeah. though? It is fun. I did it last year with a buddy of mine and uh, to, to kind of hunt close but for you know a couple hundred yards away from each other and you can get a couple guys like covering different yeah you know that is that is a really fun way to to hunt sometimes it's tough in maine you, i mean you can only hunt with three three people or it's considered driving so oh really yeah they don't it's new hampshire you can you can i think you can have up to six in new hampshire or something but uh maine it's, it's i believe three huh but in your hunting party yeah correct Depend, does it matter how far away you are from each other? Or? I mean, there's got to be stipulations. I mean, if you had six people and three people were two miles away and three yeah. people were two yeah. miles away, they, I mean, there's no way you could consider that. Yeah. I wouldn't think, anyway. But where we're hunting, they are, you know, fairly smaller sections of woods, so I wouldn't want to chance that. But yeah. a few of us do go out together, and at this particular time, it was just him and I, me and Billy, and we do that a lot. 
where just both of us will go out and we'll split up. And it's usually like we'll go to like 2 o'clock and we'll sit till dark. So on that particular day, it was really windy. And <clears throat> we went out and we split up. And I went into this, uh, it's, it's a funnel. It's a travel route. It's a known travel route for me. I mean, I've always seen buck, seen buck sign there. I've shot a couple of deer there in the past. And I set myself up on this spot with the wind just howling, but it was in my face. And, you know, like 3 o'clock, I don't know why, but something made me look over my right shoulder. And there was just an eight-pointer <laughs> destroying a tree. Yeah. I mean, like 20 yards over my shoulder. So I just watched that deer for a little while, and he ended up stopping and walking broadside right in front of me, and I took the shot, and that was that. But, yeah. you know, it was just, it was cool to have him with me. You know, it's fun to hunt by yourself. I, I love, I mean, hunt by myself more than to do anything, but to have a buddy come running up over the hill, you know, when it's done and be there with you, it was, it was pretty cool. Yeah, and help dragon, too. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. It was a long drag, it felt like, too, that night. Um. With me, same thing. I started with my dad when I was a kid and just started hunting at 10 and just went from there. And now my son, he likes to hunt, and I've been going with him. And Same same thing. We just hunt together a lot. And, yep. and like you said, it's good for dragging. When you totally, totally. Yeah, it's just better when you have the uh, some sense of a community around it, somebody to yep. share, you know, share the memories with. That's what it really is all about. And how did you two link up from that barn? Do you yeah, yeah. From there, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm a little bit older than most of these guys. But. Yeah. Same general group of friends yeah. and, and, and families um, yeah. where we live all know each other. So that's pretty much how we became friends. And, and turkey hunting has brought us to become better friends. Yeah, we turkey a, a hunt. lot of our friends are mostly just deer hunters. Yeah. yeah. And an occasional, if they get a moose permit, they go. But mm -hmm. they don't go turkey hunting. So him and I have kind of gotten together and do it as like a like a team so to speak yeah that, that's more fun because you guys you know hunting deer hunting is more of a solo thing a lot of the time yeah especially if you're a big buck killer you know being solo is going to allow you to hunt on your own terms and get in and out um so turkey is probably nice for you guys to you know you I, I don't hunt turkey yet i just i will at some point but um nice to bring more of the social aspect into the actual hunt right yeah it allows us to be not as serious too like i take deer hunting very seriously yeah i mean that's probably the most serious thing very yeah. serious so when we're turkey hunting i mean obviously we're still mm -hmm. being serious but it's like if it doesn't if it doesn't work out it's not the end of the day we'll yeah start Plus it's, it's like the first hunting thing of the new year you know <laughs> after you've been through a long mm -hmm. winter yep and normally i used to just basically turkey hunt alone but only in maine and it was just Justin that said, oh, you should come hunt with me in New Hampshire. I said, well, I'll try it. And we've been doing it now for, what, f at least five years. And we'll take a turn. And the next place we go, it'd be he he's up front to shoot. And we I call, and yep. then it's my turn. He calls, and we just, next thing you know, we each got a couple, and we're done in New Hampshire. And yeah. Or we're back and or we switch. Sometimes go from Maine to New Hampshire just to break, break it up a little. Every once in a while, he'll throw me 20 bucks for gas. But it's been like, well. I think he's given me 40 bucks in like six <laughs> years. So, Anyone listening right now who knows Mutsy knows his wallet's uh, full of... I think of, it's uh, more like 60, but... His, wa his wallet's full of uh, lint and cobwebs. He doesn't open it off. Well, though. I had to work hard. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you bow hunt too? I do uh, a little bit. Uh, yep. Mostly... Uh, I do a little bit of the uh, expanded, yeah. but uh, mostly I'll go like just regular archery season in the regular zone, mm -hmm. just to try to get the jump on a decent one if I'm getting some decent pictures, whereas, you know, he'll probably be at his heaviest weight at, in, in October. But uh, I've gone with Justin a couple of times on the uh, coastal hunt. Uh, very interesting. I've seen some deer. It's good. And you, with the expanded, you can get an extra buck, right? If you shoot one, then you still get a tag in uh, regular season for rifle or no? Yep. 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 You get one extra buck, and then you get, you know, unlimited doe tags. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's not like, uh, you know, I guess in the regular, the non-expanded zones, if you shoot one, you're done. You're done. Yes. Yeah. And it, it allows you to kind of... I don't know how to even explain it, but I'm like, I get, I'm excited when it comes to deer hunting and I, and I gotta get it 
it allows me to get some of that excitement yeah, out. Yeah, you ease into your right, season. Ease into and... my bigger bucks yeah. when it comes to rifle season by, by doing the archery. And it also allows for some errors and potentially shooting a smaller buck. Like yep. <clears throat> last year, I shot uh, a, a big doe. Man, it was just light enough to see, but it was legal. And that big doe ended up being a big spike horn because, you know, the ears can hide a spike sometimes. And and that that deer was fairly close to me, and I still didn't notice the spikes. Yeah. And unfortunately, I had to tag it with my buck tag, but thankfully, it was my expanded buck tag. So, I still had my buck tag in my pocket. I was happy, and yep. you know, it is what it is. That's that's bow hunting. Yeah, it just feels it's like a bonus season. It feels like right. Yeah, exactly. Same thing with Massachusetts. A few years ago, they uh, didn't expand it. You know, everything in the whole state used to open up third week in in October, um, but now. The more suburban zones, like where I live, yep. opens up two weeks earlier, so you get, you know, it's not September, but first week of October, you know, so it feel, just feels like a bonus, a little bit of a bonus season. Yeah, so. I, I really enjoy it. I, I love it. It's just, the woods are so different, like I said. It's quiet out there, you know, the deer are doing a completely different thing than they would normally be doing. You know, you get a lot of bachelor groups, like you were saying earlier, Um the biggest thing for me is the the peace. Is there's less hunters. You're not hearing gunshots. You just you can do a lot more things. You know what I mean? Like yep. the the only downfall to expanded where we live is it's <clears throat> it can be very crowded in in certain spots. Um, if you don't have written permission, you know, to get in your own areas, there's places that we have called Rachel Carson, which is federal government property. Mm-hmm. And anyone could buy a ten dollar license to get in there, and there's a ton of deer, ton of deer in these spots. But it's nothing to go pull into one of these spots and see fifteen other trucks. Yeah. So takes the uh, fun out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but so I live in uh, I lived in York, which is a southern coastal area, mm-hmm. and that is one of the better areas for expanded, at least in my opinion. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get a lot of written permission areas. So, you know, when it comes time to expand it, I already know that I got these spots that I can go to. Um, I'm off the beaten path and I don't have to really deal with anybody else. Yeah. So. You've got a little section to yourself. Almost, yeah. Right? And, and a couple of them are like pretty decent sized farms. I mean, I've taken him to them. Yep. They're, they're beautiful they're spots. Nice. Um, in, in reality, I can hunt them all season and, and probably kill a buck even during regular, but yeah. I enjoy the different types of hunting. So yeah. instead of being smart and sitting in those stands and killing one with my bow, I, I come back, get my <laughs> rifle, and go elsewhere. But but also, just, if you let you know let those deer live there, then next year you have bigger bucks for your expanded season too. In, yeah, in and I, theory, and I, you know it's it's true. And I do mm-hmm. run cell cameras in these spots all year long, um, and I do see it. I see these deer grow, so yep. I, I know what's in there and what's not. Like I was saying earlier with those four that were together, um, all in the 140s, you know, I, I had seen those deer on camera in, in different spots. Four in the 140s, that is nice. Yeah, I'm telling you, it was wild. And I ended up getting that. I got one of them. And it was funny because, like I was saying, these spots are so close and so small. I shot that deer with my bow, and it ran, hopped up over a hill, ran a little farther. And I knew I hit it good. Um I eventually came down, got up, my, packed up my climber, got everything together. I went over to where it was. I found my arrow covered in blood, and it was perfect. And I followed the blood, and when, by the time I got to the deer, I looked up, and I was like six yards from the back end of my pickup truck. <laughs> so it was, it was perfect. You huh? couldn't make, yeah, it was just, it was beautiful. It was beautiful how it ended. No, just stats wise, like, I don't know if you guys even know or whatever, but, um, I want the listeners to know that you guys are big buck killers. You're really good hunters. Um, that 140, that's not, is that your biggest deer? No. No, my biggest in That's uh, entry level for the main, main skull and antler. Okay. My biggest in main, well, that was with a bow, so it's, I think it's a different category for points. But Yeah, 125. Um, my biggest in main is 157 and two eights. Wow. Um, and then I have... I have a dozen in the 140s. Really? Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, see, I just want people to, you know, you set the tone. Because we have, we have guys of all different levels on the podcast. And uh, just last week, right before you guys, is a guy who's never hunted before. 
but I've been mentoring him and taking him shed hunting and showing him a, little, a few basic things and just getting him into it yeah. a little more. And he's so passionate and enthusiastic about it. But the people who listen to that might be different than who want to listen to some guys like you guys. You have a dozen in the 140s, one in the 150s. And Mark, what about what about you? Yeah, my best one is a 153 and 4.8s. And the year before that, I got a nice wide 10 that was 142 and 7.8s. Yeah. And I've got a handful of them in like the high 130s. Yeah. Yeah, so you uh, guys they're are... mismatched, you know, six on one side, four on the other, or something like that. Yeah. So it's yeah, a deduction. So you have a few more in the one forties too. That, you know, yeah, oh yeah. There's... Oh, you're saying and you guys are talking net score too. Yeah. 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 So gross, like a lot of those. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, or in the one forties, one fifties. Yeah. 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 Well, those are some big deer, and then the big bodies where you guys are hunting too. Or are they two hundred pounders? Do you weigh your deer? Um, they're yeah. anywhere from one eighty to two twenty or so. You know, they're right in yeah. that range. Like, Depending biggest, on what time of the month you're getting them, yep. if they're run down or not. Yeah. The biggest, I per, my personal biggest is uh, 222.4 pounds. Um, Big and then, boy. And that's, that's all I've gotten over 200. Yep. After that, I have, I mean, more than I can even count that are in the 190s. I've yeah. been so close, like, a hundred times, yeah. it feels like. Yeah. But you know you don't want to. That's teach what everybody you don't says. Want to teach though. yourself though. You People know what say I mean? that though too, right? Like the bigger the rack. I mean, a one eighty, one ninety. A lot of times has a much bigger rack than those two hundred pound bucks. You yeah, know? that is correct. A lot of people don't understand that. Yeah. So, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, when you shoot one that's one hundred ninety seven pounds, I'm just as happy as it's two hundred yeah. pounds. Yeah. yeah. The patch yeah. is great, but it means nothing to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. I want to shoot a nice rack. Big buck. That's yeah. that's what I'm out there for. Yep. You know what I mean? If it goes over 200, awesome. That, yeah. That's yeah. that's that's a, a bonus. Bo- that's a bonus. Yeah. You know what I mean? But my goal is to every, every year my goal is to get a big buck one or two if I can help it. Yeah, <laughs> isn't it all of our goals for yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. So Mark, like, what uh, well, we'll talk both both of you guys on strategy. So what? How are you getting your big bucks? Is it a particular way that you guys hunt? Are you do you track or what? How, how do you how do you hunt? Well, I your... personally like to go scouting in the winter. Mm-hmm. Then I can see what's left in your herd in that area. Yep. And then I'll just backtrack some of these runs if there's some big tracks in them. I want to see where they're coming from. Or another day if it doesn't snow in between, I can go the other way. So you almost can figure out a circle, and you'll be you'll figure out what their core area is. Mm-hmm. And then I'll just kind of keep tabs on it, put some cameras, and if the deer are still you know, they come back the next fall. You've already gotten a basic idea of the area from your winter scouting. And I'll just try to set up some st- strategic you know, crossings and so forth. And I'll put a stand up there. Um, if for some reason I get into a muzzleloader season, which in Maine is after the rifle season, yep. if you've got snow, well then, you know, you do some tracking because most of your hunters are not there. So you're not going to run the deer into somebody else the thing is if you're in a tight area you can run them across a road or onto private property but pretty much that way i i have a good plan at the beginning of the season and just see how it works and if it gets towards the end well, then you just got to change it up a little bit and so your uh, snow. your winter scouting is big and you follow big tracks find out where they're going and just tracks in general probably too to find the um you know where are they crossing where are their highways where are the scrapes and rubs and all that right. and and then using that to put your stand location or do you hunt on the ground next to a tree do you still hunt like what are your what's your go-to i i like to to stand or sit in the morning for a few hours yep and if nothing seems to happen well then i'll get up and do a little walk and see if this sign has increased you know several hundred yards away or yep. just something like that but and like I said, in, back in the winter scouting, you know, if you're following a decent sized deer, they're bringing you by, you know, scraped areas or rubs on trees, which, you know, could be a different deer. But it just shows you that the, the bigger bucks in that area are using the same area. And we just kind of try to set up from that. So do you have places that uh, are favorite places for you to sit that you go back to year after year or you might blindly sit there or are you really basing everything on the most recent intel that you have going into it, how, how do you pick where you're going to be sitting on a particular some, day? Some spots I've hunted over several, many years, 
seem to be very good every year, but other times they seem to die out. So I'm constantly looking for a better spot. But yes, I do keep tabs on those older spots that we've always produced. And I'll, again, a trail camera. And that'll tell me a lot if it's still active, still good. So do you utilize cell cams or, um, like, do you have cell cameras that will send you send you a picture so you know, all right, well, there's deer over in that area. I might as well focus over here. Or are you doing more manual process of getting um, I've cards? just gotten into the uh, ones that go to your phone. Yep. Saves a little bit of legwork. Yep. And I do use some of the older conventional ones just in some of the closer, easier spots to go check. Yep. But the ones that are a good hike and a long ways away, I'll put a one that goes to the phone. Okay. So then you are you keeping tabs on checking those ones that are manual quite often, or how often do you let them um, sit? And... To keep the scent out of the area, I like to go like the day of a rainstorm or a day that it, the, that's going to rain that night. Mm-hmm. And it just kind of washes out any scent. I mean, I don't know if that's over precautious or not, but... That's the smart. Just works, I mean, it just works for me, so yeah. that's what I do. So, op- it's opening day of rifle season in Maine. How are you choosing what particular spot out of all the places you scouted? How do you know where you're going opening day? Well, let's say if I have ten, I've got it narrowed down to three or four are the better ones, and then because my son hunts with me, so we'll try to cover the two best ones and see what happens. The better ones meaning that the most that activity you, or the, the bigger bigger box the yeah. or the most mature box in that area. Yep. Yeah, that's wherever correct. the wind blows from that's it. And <laughs> plus two, you know, you don't want to sit in your best stand if the wind's hitting you behind the head. Yeah. So everything yep. all factors in. So you're paying a lot of attention to wind. Very. Even very with the rifle even with a rifle. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um what about what about you? What's your how do you know where you're going opening day? What what's your what are you utilizing? And how do you how are you picking your locations? So, I base most of my spots off prior year and honestly twenty year history. Yep. Um. Like I said earlier, I do like to change where I go, um, but I don't utilize cameras that often. I do have a couple cell cameras. I use them, you know, a little bit. But if I was to have cameras to to cover the grounds that I hunt, I would I would need, you know, fifty of them. Yeah. And I just don't, I don't have the time to run that many. I don't want to. Um, but the big thing for me is, I don't hunt from from fixed tree stands. I don't like to. Um, one, I don't want people knowing where I'm hunting. I don't even like my truck on the side of the road yeah. because people will go there. Yeah. I try to keep it, you know, hidden if I can. Um, two, I, I, and this is my own opinion, but a, a deer, a big buck, especially a mature buck, they know when something is different in their area. And, yeah, you can hang it six months in advance, but they're still always going to look yeah. up at that yeah. spot when they walk by it or they're going to potentially change a route. So nine out of ten bucks that I've killed, and even the most mature, have been on the ground. Um, I shoot most of my bucks while sitting on on the ground against a tree. Yep. Um, I'm very very aggressive with calling. That is that is my go to technique. Um, anyone who hunts close to me will tell you that's that's what I do. Grunting, um, snort wheeze, and and rattling. Blind. I do it blind ninety eight percent of the time. Hmm. Um, I have called in a few you know while they were in sight, but mostly blind. And what I do is I go, honestly, I, I go with my own instinct. Um, when I'm walking through the woods, there's sections of woods that I like to call dead woods. I mean, that's that's woods where deer just, they don't go there. They don't touch it. They're not going to walk through it. And, you know, I catch, I've caught a lot of people that I don't even know personally sitting in places where I'm yeah. like, you know, I, you should, I, I, and I don't like to go, I'm not going to correct anybody, you know, they'll learn on their own, but. You're sitting in a spot with a deer, never going to walk by you there, you know. Um, and I've learned that over the years. Just by looking at the woods, I can basically tell where I think there's going to be deer and where there's not. And once I figure that out, then I'll start, you know, scouting it out, looking for sign, looking for doe activity. And I stay away from, this is going to sound crazy, but I stay away from beating down deer trails. You know, when I find pounded deer trails that does are using, 
I don't sit there. I start doing 100-yard circles around those, and I look for the lighter trails that zigzag in and out of you know, swamps. Swamps are my go-to area. I personally like to hunt swamps over anything else. I do hunt other land, but I, I've killed a lot of my bigger deer around swamp areas. You look for a really big one, just a big old gnarly swamp. Big gnarly swamps, stuff. and I like gnarly swamps that have an island in the middle because, yeah. you know, I wouldn't say 9 out of 10, but I'd say 7 out of 10 times in a gnarly swamp like that with an island, there's going to be a big buck laying on it at some point in the day. And do you go out to that island? No, do I don't I don't go anywhere near it. You I try to, yeah, try to, try to his... circle the perimeter, and I find his, you know, his... Exit and entry routes, and then play it according to the wind. Um, but once I find these spots, and, and a lot of times, like I said, I'm going back to spots where I've killed bucks in prior years. And, I mean, when you kill a buck five years in a row in, in the same general vicinity, that's not going to stop. It shouldn't. It's going gonna, it's gonna to continue roughly, maybe not right there, but, you know, within that area, there's going to be another big buck. So I'll continue to hunt these areas. And, you know, as the season progresses, if, if I get pressure from other people around me or the deer just aren't where they should be, then I'll go to another spot that I know and I bounce around. I do a lot of moving. I will not focus on one spot for more than two days at most. Some of that probably because you're so aggressive with calling too, right? Like you're almost kind of like you're making yourself known whether the, the buck knows it's, you know, you fool them, you're going to kill them. But if they don't fool them, then they might be on to you. So you bounce to another spot where you right. get a fresh Right, let, let it start over. Because I'm sure there's 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 many times I'm guaranteeing that I've had a buck come up that I never even knew came there and either saw me or winded me. Yep. Um, but... It just works for me. I mean, and it works all the time. I killed last year um, three bucks, three good bucks, and I killed every one of them calling. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, let's go through the calling sequence a little bit more and how... Ooh, when that's do you, a secret. I don't know. When, when do you start? <laughs> you start before uh, shooting light. Some people will say, oh, yeah, do it 10 minutes before. But I know also that someone... It, no. Nope. Could, you could get one charging in. So when do you start? Like, what... What type of calling, um, what's a typical sequence, and what, so, what are your intervals between? So if it was just in the morning and I was going into a spot, particular spot, I would go sit and I wouldn't make any noise for the first 45 minutes, okay. even if the sun's come up. because You're probably similar on that, yeah, right? I was gonna, I was let say, the woods wake up and see what happens. Hour. Just going to let the deer do their thing because I'm already sitting myself in a spot that's uh, it's either a pinch point or a travel route or, or a known buck area anyway. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for all I know, I'm, I'm 50 yards from the deer, and yep. he, he's right there. Yep. So I'm not just going to start calling before it's it's time. So I'll let the deer move around do their thing. Because there is a chance when you start calling, you could get one that's just super finicky, and he's like, I'm out of here. Or that's, he's too close. You know, if you call close. a deer too close, sometimes it's like, bah, and they just yeah. they take right off. So there's no point, really, and just let let that buck maybe walk by you naturally in the morning. Exactly. Anyway. Yeah. And that's, you know, I've killed a lot doing that, too. But, yep. um So... Once it's up and everything's moving along, um, if I'm just sitting around, I will grunt, I don't know, 10 to 15 times, and I and I grunt loud. I mean, as loud as my grunt tube will allow. Really? And I do, that's how I do it every time, too. And I will make a 180-degree circle with my head. 10 or 15, like, in a row. Yep, not fast, but kind of... You know, wow. two seconds. Like that kind? You're doing short grunts? It's different? I mean... Yeah, shorter. Yeah. More short than long. <laughs> um, more like a... Yep. Brat, brat, brat. Yep. And I'll do that, you know, and, and I'll do it. Turn your head all the way so yeah, you're casting right. it out. So yep. casting it out. And, the, and, a, and a buck isn't just going to sit straight and, and grunt. Usually they're on the trot and their head's going side to side, side to side, side to side. So I'll do that. And then I used to use um, the can, the bleak can, but I got rid of it. I don't use it anymore. Um, I found that that bleak can was getting a ton of immature bucks. Correct. I would get Correct. You know, four yeah. pointers, six pointers, um, and huh. and it can actually scare deer away because if it that if that can's done wrong, it actually puts an alert and it and it can scare deer away. Um, so I'll do that grunting sequence and then I'll throw a couple snort wheezes and then I'll rattle a little bit. Um, nothing crazy. I just tickle the horns a little bit, thrash the leaves around, and then... So you basically do it one after the other. You do all your grunts, yeah, then right you snort, you do all of it. Right in a row. Hmm. 
And then I'll wait it out probably 15 to 20 minutes at max, and then I do it again. And I'll do that repeatedly for a half hour or so, 45 minutes. And if nothing happens, I get up, I'll walk 100 yards, I sit back down, and I do it all over again. Wow. And I continue to do it. Um, and I had a, you know an instance, actually the bigger one I shot, the 220-pound deer, where I walked up to the edge of a hayth, a big swamp, I had saw that I'd seen the deer walk by me, early early light, and then it just vanished. And I had done some grunting, and you know nothing happened. So I walked up to the edge of the swamp, and I took my grunt out, and I I think I did probably fifteen, maybe even twenty, loud obnoxious grunts, and then I did two snort wheezes with just my mouth, and then. I snapped a branch, and I turned around, and I ran. And I mean, I ran loud, breaking stuff, crashing, blowing through the trees. And then I got to this pine tree where I had already cleared out a spot to sit, and I turned around, and I sat down real fast. And then I started scraping the ground. You like, just pretending you're a deer. Yeah, yeah. just like, or, yeah. or, or, or there's a brawl going on or whatever. Because it is funny. We don't, I, a lot of people, the hunting public's making it popular, you know, doing the scraping, but running you don't think to like but a deer will do that i'm telling you'll you, see a deer just somebody, book it and then stop yep. and you know so why not do that <laughs> if somebody sense. would have seen me do this or caught it on video they would have been like what yep. is he doing and i personally said to myself what did i just do because i'm aggressive <laughs> when it comes to calling but i'm yep. usually not that aggressive <laughs> And I'm like, man, I hope I didn't just screw that up. I'm like, I couldn't believe it. Did you snap the stick on purpose? Or I snapped it on purpose. All right. I, I literally yeah. snapped it oh. over, and then I ran back to my spot. I sat down, and I just thrashed the ground, and I grunted a few more loud times. And I'm telling you, I didn't even set my grunt tube down, and I looked up, and all I saw was just this big old rack coming out of that swamp, head first right to me. He came right out of the swamp, up onto a, uh, like over the lip of the swamp, and he walked, and I shot that deer at eight feet, right <laughs> in the chest. Yeah. That was the 220-pound deer that I shot, that yep. 156. And, and he knew exactly where you were. That deer was coming to fight me. Yeah. You know what I mean? He right where I was, he legit thought I was another deer. And Wind was me, had to be in your face, too, right? Which is key. Yeah, the know. wind was perfect. It yep. was in my face, and, and I knew that, too. I had actually checked that before I even went in the woods that day. I got out of my truck, and I have that. You know, I checked it with a little bit of powder, and... The wind was perfect. Otherwise, I wouldn't have went in there because I know they're bedded in this swamp all the time. And where I have to walk in, the wind would have been right at them. So the wind was already good, and I knew that. Um, but the aggressive thing, to me, it, it works. And this is just just for me. I don't know how for others, you know. And it's, it's scary when you do it in the woods, but I've had it work more than not work. But the most that's going to happen is it's not going to work. So you got a 50-50 yeah. shot here. Yeah. It's either going to work or it's not. People will, you say it's scary because people might think, oh, shit, I just blew my whole day. Yeah. Blew my whole day, blew the whole hunt. I was too, super aggressive. you got to remember, when we're not in the woods, deer hear branches fall. They hear things crash. They hear other animals walk all the time. You know, to grunt and to, to snort wheeze, I don't care how aggressive and loud you do it, it's not going to ruin anything. If mm -hmm. anything, it's going to benefit you like it did me. Um, I mean, I've, I've had that exact same occurrence happen on at least five deer that I can think of. Big, mature bucks. Come, know, come crashing out of crashing the Crashing right at me. Yeah. I mean, and I've shot them all within 15 yards. You know, and, and the other, most of the other deer I've shot were also called in. They weren't in such a dramatic... Um, stage as that but they were all called in uh, most of them now when you're super aggressive like that and making all that noise and thrashing around and you're the ones you're talking about are mature bucks do you ever call out a younger buck doing that or they just don't even want to bother with it when they they hear how aggressive no, you are? i've had multiple young bucks come in to investigate they're not scared yeah they're curious they don't know what's on their head they don't know what's on their head testosterone's flowing they're yeah. coming yeah that's why they get beat up all the time yeah you know? I've actually had the, the so you've noticed off those tactics work for all all different age groups of bucks, but yeah. don't do the can because that is attracting younger bucks to, mostly to me, only to me. I mean, yeah, that's and that's my, the same experience that I've had with. I'm that. sure it's worked yep. for other people, but I've called in more does and immature bucks with that can than anything. Yep, 
I've heard people say that the deer have like learned that can because people overused it, you know, and it's like a kind of a weird, you know, it's a weird sounding, but it's a very unique. It's a, it, it's unique. So yeah. people, if everybody used it for years, that they've kind of it, it's evolved. True. It's to, true. I, it's funny you say that too, because I've actually been here in Massachusetts before, and I've been in the middle of two people using the same thing, and I could hear. Rah, 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 yeah. and I'm like, it just doesn't sound natural. No, yeah. it didn't sound natural at all, but. Yeah, I mean, that's that, that's the biggest thing for me is calling. Oh, excuse me. I do uh, I do utilize a climber a lot. Um, when, I'm, when I'm not, you know, still hunting and walking the ground, I'll have my climber on my back. I'm in an area where I already know there's deer sign and where there's bucks. Um, and a lot of times I'll just get to where I know or think that's a good spot for a buck, and I will sit in my climber for the whole day. And you, you are you... Uh rattling and calling the whole day from your climber yep. too yeah but then, nine times but, out of ten depending on the year i mean when it's early early season i don't i refrain from going hard on it obviously during expanded bow season i don't call at all in right. the beginning yeah. at all i'm yeah. just getting in between the food source and bedding and i'm just letting things happen um once i start seeing scrapes break open like we were talking about earlier you know like probably like third week in september I'll start adding a little bit of gr- a little bit of grunting and yeah. light tickle on the horns. Yeah, and I've killed a bunch of deer that way, um, but it doesn't work near as well as it does once once October hits. I'll start picking up the pace a little bit, but my the best time for me has be, been the the last week of October, beginning of November, like right until the eleventh of November has been my best week to... That's your most aggressive couple of weeks of uh, calling. Yeah, that's, that's been my most luck with aggressive calling and shooting a slammer buck that way. Um, and I and I do I do track, too. I mean, I, I have everything in the mix, but my favorite thing is, is still hunting and, and getting into places where I already know there's one or two big bucks just from... Come meet and learn from the best hunters in the Northeast this summer at Huntstock, America's reinvented hunting show. Taking place August 11th through the 13th at Wildwood Farm in Westminster, Massachusetts, you can expect three days of hunters and brands coming together to celebrate hunting, meeting and learning from legendary hunters, winning prizes from our over $30,000 worth of giveaways, featuring more than seven guns, by the way, bows, arrows, tree stands, saddles, camo apparel, grills, optics, and much more, and having the best time that you've ever had at a hunting show guaranteed. All ticket purchases to Huntstock come with a door prize entry uh, to win some of those awesome door prize giveaways, which we'll draw at the end of each day. Kids under 12 are free. It's a family event, so bring your kids. Uh, For adults, it's $40 per day, or you can get a three-day pass for $80, or you can get a three-day super pass for $150, which will get you entry all three days, unlimited 3D archery, and double the door prize entries. For trackers and fans of the Benoit family, we're happy to announce that Woodman Arms has partnered with the Benoits to reproduce their legendary DVD series, which will be available for the first time at Huntstock this summer. They are likely to sell out, so make sure you get your tickets to Huntstock so you can get your hands on those DVDs before they're gone. If they don't sell out, they'll be available online at woodmanarms.com. With hunters from all generations at Huntstock like Lanny Benoit, Hal Blood, Jim Massett, Joe Donito, Rodney Elmer, and John Altman, all the way down to younger killers like John Lewis, Brett Joy, Neil Pendleton, Jake Bennett, Joey Davis, Isaac Young, Pat Burns, and hunting groups like Big Woods Bucks, Just Hunt Club, Mountain Deer, ADK Trackers, Northwoods Whitetails, Hunting Me, Hunt Suburbia, Stagger, and more, there's not a better show in the world to meet and learn from hunters of all age groups. And with a 3D archery course designed to give you real-life hunting scenarios, 50-plus hours of simultaneous seminars and live podcast programming on multiple stages, an outdoor classroom where you can learn from legends in an intimate setting, immersive experiences like following a blood tracking dog as he tracks down a deer or learning how to butcher a deer or getting up into a tree saddle for the first time and trying out different types of stands, over 80 plus sponsors from the hunting world displaying and selling their new gear and top brands that the Northeast has not seen around in a long time like Vortex, 
Kuyu, Mossberg, Sig Sauer, Ruger, Darn Tough Vermont, Delta McKenzie, Hoyt, Easton, and more. You do not want to miss this show. You can get your tickets at www.huntstockevents.com today, or you can get them at the door if we don't sell out. So this summer, we'll see you at Huntstock. Either seeing them on a trail camera that I do have, or just experience from prior year. Now, when you rip through a spot like that, and let's say you do three of those sequences and you move up the edge of the swamp 100, 200 yards, you do it again. And, you know, do you, after, you know, 10 o'clock, or is there a certain time where you're like, all right, I think I've, I've, I've made anything in this area known, I'm going to now go bounce to one of my other spots that, that I have, that I know there's bucks, or do you just stay in there the whole day moving around in that same patch of woods? Um, no, but typically I'll come out around 10 o'clock, um, but I'll go back into that same piece of woods. Cause that it, night? Yeah, that day. I mean, yep. I'll go eat, usually eat lunch or something and then go back in. Um, it's not affecting anything. That deer could have been just on the other side of the swamp I was at. I mean, I've done calling sequences where I'm moving up 100 yards, you know, every yep. every half hour, 45 minutes or so. And then I turned around and I'm walking out and that buck was coming in from behind me mm-hmm. and, and ended up shooting it, you know, yep. right there. So... You just never know. It could it could be right just out of sight. I mean, I try to stick with it as long as I can, but I don't I don't typically go past ten o'clock in that one spot. I'll I'll move out of there or I'll go in from another yeah angle, you know, a lot farther away. I mean, the big buck's in there somewhere. You know what I mean? And if nothing happens, then I'll give that spot a break though. I will yeah. go back okay. in there the next day. Yeah. That's what I was wanting to get at is like how when when do you feel like you played it out where you were too aggressive a little bit and let it settle down? That's yeah, I won't. I'll give it a day or two. I have, I mean, I have so many spots. There's no need for me to go back into that. Yeah, and that's that's kind of why how I was saying like I make hunting an adventure because I like to go bounce around to all these different spots. There's no need for me to focus or put all my time into one area. Because I know there's a big buck just as big in this next piece of woods or this next piece of woods. And you're staying active. It's always something going on. I'm just just moving around. I'm seeing deer. It keeps me going. And then I'll start that cycle back over again if nothing happens, you know, but... Now, Mark, what's your mentality on uh, calling and what do you do? back a while, Justin, I brought up a, a point. Like, these bucks, if they live in the same area, they'll get wise to people's stands or the way they walk to their stand and all that and i have a few spots that are similar to that where i've had to actually physically like move the stand back or forward or to the side 20 30 50 yards just to eliminate that the area where they seem to be a little like nervous going through there yeah and that seems to have helped out quite a bit yeah um and as far as a calling for me the first, like the, the opening of the rifle season, I'm kind of laid back, just letting things happen. What week is that in May? That would be either the last Saturday of October. Okay. And then it goes yep. through to Thanksgiving. So Thursday. right about when you're starting to get really aggressive with your calling. Yep. yep. So <clears throat> that the first week, you know, I'll wait like an hour or so after daylight. And then I'll give out a few grunts. And like you said, you know, you turn to make it your sound go in different angles. And just kind of let it go and give it another hour and then try it again. And if nothing happens, just quietly just back out. But it sounds like you're a little less aggressive with calling than than Justin is. I like to, what I say, the double digits of the month is what I say. Like from the 10th on of November Mm -hmm. is when now the bucks are starting to get a little bit more aggressive. You know, the rut's starting or, or has already started. And they're more aggressive, and they're more on their feet. So that way, they the calling. If he's in hearing and he's interested, you can pull him towards you. And I just kind of step it up as a later that we get into November. Now, are you more of you'll sit in the same spot all day? And, and uh, no, no, I'm basically like he said, you no know, nine thirty, ten ish. You know, you can tell. Oh uh, yeah, you're not seeing much. Or even if you're not hearing much shooting in the area, there's kind of a, just a, one of those quiet days where not much is happening. Mm-hmm. So but, just get up and move around there. Yeah, and, uh, I'll, uh, I'll hook up with my son or what if I'm by myself and regroup, and I might go to another stand that's 
several hundred yards away, different angle, different type of woods, different things. Now, out of your big bucks that you've killed, um, how many came in from like a calling sequence versus, you know, just roughly, or versus you were in the pinch point, the right travel mm -hmm. route? Most of the time, the, the pinch point worked for itself. But I have done a sequence of calls and like 20 minutes later, boom, there he is. So did he, was he coming anyway or was he coming to the call? Mm -hmm. I don't know, but yep. he ended up going in the truck. That's all I know. <laughs> you had the right phone number when you called him. That's right. <laughs> yep. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, his style is different than mine. Yours would be different. Yep. Everybody has a different style. Yep. It's whatever works for you. If you're having good success, you know, if you try something 50 times and it doesn't work, well, maybe you should do something different. Yeah. But if it's working for you 50% of the time, that's not bad. Yeah. You know? That's pretty good. Those are pretty good odds. Do um, you carry rattle horns too? Do you carry I, I, I have not as much as I used to when yeah. I was younger, obviously. Um, so your calling is, is, is mainly a grunt. grunt yeah, tube. I'm using my yeah. grunt tube mostly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Do you use the snort wheeze at all? I tried it a few times in the last two or three years. Um, nothing came at the time, but just could be just coincidental. You know, I don't know. I, I've been playing with it. I, I really like it. I, I, I love I, it. I, 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 it really does get, you'll see, you can even see the buck's hair stick up a little bit if they're oh, yeah, close enough. Oh, yeah, if you get one to come it, in, yeah. his posture is going to tell you, tell you everything. You yeah. know, I, and that's the biggest thing, too, I tell people, because I've had a lot of people... You know, ask me instruction on calling and how I do it, and I've had a, a bunch come back like it's just it's not working. You know, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. But the biggest thing is the deer also have to be in your area. It, yeah, you can't call. You can call all day long, but if there's not a deer within a hundred yards or you know, within hearing distance, I should say, yeah. it's not going to happen. So that's that's kind of where I get into the moving thing. That's why I move a lot. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta, I, you gotta relocate. Yeah, there's so many guys listening to this podcast, and uh, and me and you, and and we've all we're all in this situation a lot too, where you're sitting in a spot, but there just isn't a deer or even a, a buck that you can shoot within five hundred thousand yards of you, and they're just never gonna come. So if right. you just if you just sat there all day quietly waiting for something to happen, you were never in the game without even knowing it. So right. at least you're putting yourself into the right. game by moving rattling calling you you always feel like you're that, right in that is why I, that's one reason it's that's a good point that's one reason i call it's not it's not just because it works but it it gets me excited when i call yeah now it's like everything just started over again it's like all right now i get myself ready because at any moment he could come walking around that corner because he heard my call you know what i mean yeah when you just sit there quiet all day long and don't do anything yeah like you're saying, if there's a deer a thousand yards you away, can, you can get guilty of this too. You just may not picking your phone up and getting disconnected from your hunt because I do it all the right, time. Right, it walks if by. A, if I'm in a stand all yeah, day, it's like, you know, oh yeah, yeah I you do look it all up the time. and you, you look up and you see the back end of him going by. <laughs> I've had it happen. I've had him walk right up behind me while I'm on my phone and just, yep. you know, it's my own fault. But yeah, if you sit there, you can sit there all day, and if there's not a deer in your general area. If you're not calling or not doing anything and you're just sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, you could be wasting time. You right. could be. Yep. I I move pretty fluently through the woods. You know, I, I don't give it any more. Most of the time, I don't give it any more than a half an hour to, to 40 minutes before I move to the next spot. Because if again. that deer is in hearing distance in a half an hour, he's going to show if he's interested. Right. But I will say... Yeah, it's not like he's going to slowly make his way for an hour and a half in after yeah. your first sequence, right? Typically like, not. Yeah, uh, he's going to... They're coming in. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. So wait wait the half hour, but you know, if you're waiting an hour, you might be wasting a second half hour. Right. Get into a new spot. I will say, though, like the, you know, <clears throat> half an hour, 40 minutes, and then I move thing, that's usually for me between 10 and 2. Before 10 o'clock and two ten o'clock, I sit in one spot and I do not move. Yep. And then the same thing with the afternoon, because obviously we, everybody knows that yep. deer moving a lot more in the morning and afternoon. So yep. come 2 o'clock, it's my favorite time 
is the late afternoon. I, yeah. I love late afternoon. You get into a spot that feels bucky. Exactly. You, you yep. taper down your calling, or maybe when do you go silent? Honestly, I, I probably won't go silent at all, but I won't be aggressive the whole time. I yep. will, you know, one or two, three grunts maybe every half an hour. And then as it gets closer to the real bucky time, you know, the, yep. the, the last hour and a half, whatever, when the woods just really settle and, you know, that thing could be walking by at any moment. I might throw one buck, I mean, one grunt out, two grunts out, but I'm just letting the woods do their thing at this point. Yeah, you know, definitely. But I, I like to, I genuinely sit as long as I possibly can in the morning and the afternoon after two o'clock. When you're moving in between spots, you know, um, when you're going 100, 200 yards or whatever, do you get to your next place? Are you trying to be quiet? Or are you trying to sound like a deer while you're moving there? Or are you stomping your feet? What, what, how do you normally? I walk normal. I don't try to be quiet. Just I walk purposely normal. just walk like a, like a deer would. I just let my feet do their thing. I mean, obviously I avoid snapping large branches because yeah. that's going to get the attention of anything in sight. But, um, you know, deer walk through the woods, and they hear other deer walking through the woods. When you're creeping through the woods and trying to be quiet, now you sound like a predator because yeah. that's what predators do. Yeah. And I avoid doing that at all costs. The only time I walk super quiet is when I'm trying to sneak in the woods at dark in the morning to get to my, like, a stand I already have or whatever. But, uh, no, when I go that 100 yards, 200 yards, I just walk. I just make my way, and I try to get there. I'm obviously scanning as I'm hunting, but... You know, I bring up a, a time in New Hampshire, for instance, where I, I was calling um, at first light. You know, I think it was like 40 minutes after the, the sun had come up. I started to do my calling sequence. Nothing happened. So I moved 100 yards. I did it again. Nothing happened. So I'm, I moved that 100 yards, and there was like a stone wall. And I walked up to it, just normal. And I sat down. And I had a scope on my rifle at the time, and I scanned everything behind that stone wall, just looking for you know potential deer laying down or whatever I was looking for. And I didn't see anything, so I sat down and I went to go do my third calling sequence, and I didn't even get to my third grunt, and a deer jumped up, jumped over the stone wall, turned and faced me, <laughs> and it was a big 10-point buck. That deer was laying on the other side of the stone wall, so I had my my rifle scope, and I'm looking off in the distance. The deer was right in front of me. <laughs> That's crazy. And I walked up to that spot yeah. just with a normal pace. Yeah. And and it just it must have been asleep. Yeah. And it was almost like insane. It was like somebody dropped that deer out of the sky when I did that. Hmm. And that was another deer I shot in the chest, and it was like from here to the camera tripod, man. That's crazy. <laughs> it it was like. Was it windy or anything that day? No, or no, it was calm and it was the leaves were loud. Wow, it was just but very bizarre. Maybe he was deaf too. He could have been or yeah. something wrong with his hearing. Maybe. Yeah, he well, he's deaf now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was that was crazy. That, that deer just came out of nowhere, just like. So it just shows, though. You know, you you can walk by a deer at two feet sometimes, and you you might not even know they're there. Yep. You know? Yep. Crazy. What about uh? You said um you, that you avoid a beaten down deer deer trail. Well, why why do you why do you do that? So do the big bucks avoid those and carve their own? I, I don't see getting used I, by the I family don't necessarily, group, the and the lambs and yeah. yeah I don't necessarily bucks. avoid it per se, but I don't sit. I would never hang a tree stand and and watch it i wouldn't just sit there and watch it because most of those pounded deer trails and i know i've, I've learned it from experience but i've also put trail cameras on them 90 percent of the time it's you know six does three or four does and a couple smaller ones using those things and the buck is it's there but it's just it's outskirting those things yeah it's skirting the edge so you know i'll set up in, a, in an area where i'm watching 100 yards away from that pounded pounded area yeah you know, and especially if there's a swamp, you know, that, like, I'll be in an area where the buck usually hot, gets in the thickest stuff possible, where it's downwind of that pounded trail where the does are running, you know what yep. I mean? Yep. So, his eyes and everything's focus is up there, and I'm down here right where he is. is that's where I want to be. Hmm. That's a good point. And, like, if, so when you're scouting um, in the winter a lot, 
do you pay much attention to those doe trails at all or are you focused um, on just where the big bucks are, are if going? If it's an area that I've hunted in the past, they're usually this, in the same areas most of the time. But uh, I'm, I'm really focusing on pinch points and bottlenecks is, is what I'm looking for for the following season. Yeah. And it's a... Uh, those and are, if, the, if the food crop is terrible, like the last two years, we didn't have much for acorns. Yeah. So things changed. Um, sightings were less and so forth. But on a normal year, that's what I'm really looking for is the pinch point. Yeah, it's the same thing like you, uh, for guys who hunt fields or agriculture and stuff too, the, you you see the progression of the deer that come out into the field and usually it's like the does first yep. and the fawns and then a young buck maybe and those big bucks are hanging back and they're using them as security blankets exactly right and it's it's the same thing with maybe right as you're alluding to that those trail the main highways the bucks are smart enough to not use the main highway because they know that all kinds of predators can be honing in on those main highways so let's carve our own you know like you see in the old so i don't know if it's they're like this in maine and vermont there's all these old highways you know the original highway and then the new highway gets built and then the original highway is just kind of off on the side right yeah. and uh you know those are the fun ones to drive to drive on and uh it just, maybe that's you know that's what how you, maybe you think about that's how uh, big bucks are going to be moving in that that manner and then uh hone in on a good spot right yeah and don't get me wrong a big buck will use those trails and, yeah and they do but and they might I, be following a doe on it during the rut too. But. I used to focus, you know, when I was inexperienced long time ago. I used to focus on those pounded deer trails, and I'm always excited. I was like, "All right, you should see these tra- pounded trails I found." And I would sit there, <laughs> and time after time, it's like doe, spike on doe, sp- or doe, and I'm not seeing these big bucks. And it's like, then like an hour later, I get these giant bucks on camera, yeah. you know behind me or I, I change my aspect I should say to where I'm facing and it's like oh he's over here you know what I mean so I'm, I was I was focusing all my attention on these ripped up pounded deer trails and that's not where I needed my attention my attention needed to be you know in, the, in a spot where there's very the ed- little on the, on the edges right little very little trails very little sign Bucks don't like to leave behind where they're coming and going from. They, you know, they want to be hidden as much as possible. So if you can find those tiny footsteps, those tiny areas where they're coming in and out of, that's that's to me, and in my opinion, where you want to be, not on these absolute pounded out areas. Yeah, you hear about that. Like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the hunting beast, right? And Dan Infold, who's just yep. a, an, an animal, right? And a lot of people look up to him and his teachings and stuff. And he's always talking about if you're honing in on swamps, there is going to be major highways coming in and out of the swamps. But he, he says, don't, you know, similar to what you're saying, don't hone in on those major highways because the real big bucks are going to have their own little exit. And it, it, it might be really hard to notice, for especially for a rookie hunter or somebody that's novice, exactly. you know, but but if you've done it enough, you can you, you're like oh there's a just a tiny little break in the leaves there that you can tell exactly something goes through there and then you go and just investigate it a little bit big big droppings or a big track there or maybe there's a big rub 15 yards into the swamp there and you're like oh this this is probably where he's coming in it might be only one of his 30 exits out of that swamp yep. but most of the time it's not going to be on that main that main one key to me key for me is uh finding their beds obviously if you, if you can get in there and find where a giant buck is bedding outside of the deer season obviously find where he's bedding then you can start reversing from there where he's going and find those very little used travel routes and you know at some point you're going to catch him yep what about scrapes do you guys do you hunt scrapes mark pay attention to scrapes much um, I do. I look for them, and because I look at the size of the track that's in them, if if it's the ground is you know readable, and yeah, I mean that'll tell me you know if if I don't have a camera in that area, it tells me that there's one coming there. So I would look at where he would be uh, coming coming from, and just kind of focus and look scout in that area to see like where is he coming from to get to that. 
spot. Do you put cameras up on scrapes? Like, if you're in a new spot, that, that's my favorite thing to do. I see a big old unmistakable scrape that is being used by... I would, I would try one for a week or two to yeah. see if it's getting used yeah. regularly. And just see what kind of bucks are and in there. And, like, even, like, when I'm with my son, I'll show him a picture. I'll say, look, this buck is in the afternoon, and he's coming from the left going right every time. So during the day, he's over there. Mm-hmm. So in the morning, we want to try to focus hunting somewhere in that area because he's he's coming from somewhere to return to that area. Yeah, you know he's betting there during the day. If Correct. he's always coming that direction in the evening, yep. then you've, you've got a pretty good idea, at least the t- direction he's betting and where he's going <clears throat> to feed, right? Yep. And then you hone in on those, you know, do your detective work and hone in on uh, trying to pin down exactly where he's betting, like you were just talking about, right. finding the actual bed. And a lot of times, if it, even if I'm sitting on the ground, I won't be super far from another stand, but one would be better in the morning, in the afternoon, if they're on that yep. circle. You're just trying, you, to, you trying to catch them the during daylight. What have you said on the ground, Mutsi? <laughs> oh, quite a bit. <laughs> He's such a big stand hunter. What kind of stands do you, do you use? I've got a couple ladders, and I've got some hang-ons. Yep, so you like having fixed locations, not um, no climbers? I have or... some spots that have been there for years that have years produced. Old. Yeah. And now I'm just moving around with the ladders easier to move. I take them apart, put them in a jet sled, drag them around. Yep. And, yeah, I like those are easier to reset. Yeah. You got Jeez. a couple of those that are in real killing spots that you've killed, you know, three or four or um, five out of? The f- one I put up in t- 2020... Yep. And I got a nice nine-pointer there in that stand. But it's because it was a big acorn yeah. knoll there, crop. Yeah. So in the last two years, we haven't had acorns. So my pictures there have been all the family family group, smaller yep. bucks or a little basket eights and stuff yep. like that. Just traveling through. So I'm thinking this year, there's no way it's going to be three years in a row with no acorns. Yep. So I will be focusing there this fall to see what the trees are holding. Yep. Think he'll still be there? You've been waiting for me. Yeah, you got a good one here after. Yeah, he's yeah, really nice. There's a few in there. That was something I was going to ask you guys too: is how, how how often do you hunt a particular deer, or have them on your target list, or whatever, or are you just kind of looking for a bunch of mature options? Like, do you hunt specific deer? Sounds like you're hunting one right now. Yeah, I've got two in the last couple of years that I've been trying to get between what my son and I were trying to block these holes, and. Those stands, I only use them when the wind is actually not perfect. Nothing's perfect, but, I mean, in, in a hunter's favor, our favor. And there's times I want to go, but the wind's wrong, yeah. and I'll get a picture. I'm yeah. like, well, yeah. I probably wouldn't have got that picture if I was sitting there because right. he would have smelled me. Yeah. So I don't want to – the average person gets too excited, and they'll overhunt certain stands, and that's a big mistake that – even, That's why you got to hunt on the ground. Even seasoned hunters make. Yeah. Yeah, so you got to be a little bit more mobile. And if the wind's not right, if you've got a stationary stand, you just don't go. Yeah. Yeah. It's and not it's, worth blowing them out of there. Right. No. What is this one that you're after? A real big um, 12 point? Is he's he at typical? eight with a couple kickers now because he's getting up in age. I'd say he's probably six. Yep. Cool. Um, the, uh, there's a couple other ones. Uh, one's a, got a wide 10. Every year he's got broken points. I don't know how that happens. He's, he's just an aggressive buck. Yeah, he's got a nice frame. He's probably 20 plus inside. But he's got a point or two broke on each side the last three years in a row. Hmm. Uh, I don't get just it. Just a brawler, sounds like. Yep. Um, got a couple upcomers. They probably were three and a half this year. Had nice eight point frames. So we'll see if they come back this year. But that one has been kind of taunting me is it a yeah. lot of tip, typical bucks where you're hunting or you see some drop tines um, and non-typical stuff happening i've gotten one and my son has just short ones not big drops you know just yeah. short yeah but mostly uh typical you know you get double brow tines split brow tines things like that but as a rule they're typical frames yep yeah. cool what about you you had got any particular bucks that you're after yeah um i have like two or three um, real, real good bucks that I'm after. I wouldn't, I wouldn't focus on a particular buck per se. Um, like I said, I like to bounce around and I know there's multiple deer that are 
in my shooting category in other spots. So yep. I, I try not to, to, to waste all my time on one particular deer, but... But you will stop by and try to go well, after those. Yeah, so currently I have three on my radar that are worth my time. Um, and one is a very non-typical, has last year at least 14 countable points that I, yep. I was wow. able to count. Um, and then I have another in the same area that looks like he's in the probably one high 150s again. Very big deer. So this year, I mean, he's going to be a, just a tank. But uh, I just, I don't put too much energy onto it because I don't want to blow them out of there. So I'll hunt it, you know, a day, see how it happens, see how it works out. If nothing happens, I'll bounce around to my other spots. And if I shoot a buck, then that's it. I'm done. How do you um, pick what day you're going in for like that big non-typical, right? I'll check the, be a I'll, special deer. I'll check the wind, you know what I mean? You know, I'll, you have an idea where he beds or Yeah, where yeah, I have an idea where he beds. <laughs> I kind of have an idea of his routine. Um, and going back to the scrapes, I, I didn't really bring it up. Um, I, I'm big on scrapes, but it's got to be the right scrape, like you were saying, if it's one that's used all, a lot. Because a lot of people focus on, on scrapes and, you know, one mature buck can make 15 scrapes in, yeah. in, in a half an hour. Yeah. And he may never go back to those scrapes again. You know yeah. that, obviously. Um, but what I've been doing the past, like, five years, and it's a, it's really, really paid off for me, is the, uh, the mock scrape with the vine technique. And it is just, I mean, I can't even tell you how, how amazing it's been. I've shot six or seven bucks on these scrapes in the past six years um so is that kind of where you'll go and station before you start uh you'll get near that mock scrape and that that'll be one of your hammering sequences exa exactly yeah. or i'll go in with my climber um if i'm hunting one of my mock scrapes i typically go in with a climber just to keep my scent off the ground as best as i can but i'll put those mock scrapes in early i put them in in like july august and they start getting used people don't understand they deer use use scrapes all year round oh yeah if it's it's if it's a territorial i mean a um, community scrape and the great thing about it is is when i make these big scrapes and i put that vine in there i don't use any scent at all none in fact i piss in my own scrapes yep um and then i just leave it alone i will put a camera on there i know i said earlier i don't use much cameras but i like to see if anything's at least hitting that mark scrape Mm -hmm. But when I make those mock scrapes and I hang that vine, the greatest the greatest advantage of it is once the does start hitting it, smaller bucks, they're they're leaving their eye glands scent all over that vine. And you don't have to do anything. And it, it they just it takes over on its own and it'll become a highway. And that was the case last year with one of them in particular. I, I started having like a group of six does come by and I got a bunch of pictures of them literally standing right up you know doing all kinds of crazy things and then smaller bucks would show and then bigger and then bigger and then I eventually had uh, two of the shooters I was talking about come to these mock scrapes yeah it's like the momentum picks up right it. as the season progressed the bigger deer started showing up and I got those two that I that I'm very much after and I will hunt this year um to try to kill one of those two before anything else. And I, I won't over, like you were saying earlier, I will not overdo it because if, if, if they even see you just one time, it could change the whole course of everything. Or if they just get an idea you're there. That's kind of why I like to use my climber and not leave a permanent stand. Um, Around your scrapes. Yep. All right. So... Again, what are you using for like a, a vine? Is it a product or is it a rope? Or no, is it's it an actual a... vine. Okay, I, so I go you're... in the woods and cut them. Yeah. Um, and those, the reason those, those woody vines, yeah, yeah, it's like a yeah, it's like spirally woody yep. vine. And the reason yep. is, is one, they live forever after they're cut. They don't shrivel up mm. and die and brown up. Um, two, when the deer use it, they like it. They like things that sway and move. Um, so you know, I make that mock scrape, and then I actually put a drill a hole in the top of the vine. I put a circle, um, a zip tie. Yeah. And then I use multiple zip ties and make like a chain almost. And then I tie that to another branch. You want that thing to actually be able to swing mm. freely yeah, and not be tight. Um, but you're actually drilling a hole through the vine and putting that zip tie through the hole? Yep. Yeah, okay. And I save all those vines. Mm -hmm. So if, if, say that 
that site doesn't pan out or it goes dead for some reason, I'll just take that vine and I and I'll take it somewhere else and I hang it and the scent from the deer that I'd hit it, yeah, it, you know, it works immediately. I mean, the, do you worry about your hand scent at all? Are you using no. gloves or nope. you you don't worry about that? I dig those. I dig every one of my scrapes out with my own bare hands. I mean, within hours, the scent's already diminished. Yeah enough and if not it's going to be gone by the next day it's and not going to lay down a cover of pneumonia i mean ammonia exactly. over it uh, by pissing yeah, on people it people don't and... believe it but i mean i i have multiple multiple trail cam pictures of bucks hitting my scrape within hour after i pissed I, I got a great video of last year me doing just that making a mock scrape putting the camera up peeing into it and it was like 45 minutes later 145 inch eight pointers you yep. know in there just Ammonia is ammonia. Loving it, you know? Yep. Yeah. So I know that it it's works. It's bizarre. It really is, but it does work. And I use, I, I try to put out like 12 to 15 of those if I can. Just gives me more areas to sit because like I said, I, I like to sit on the ground. I use my climber a lot. So it's an area I know I can get within. Yep. You know, a couple hundred yards. Hopefully there's a buck yep. wanting to visit. You do any mock scrapes? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, on some of these mock scrapes, a lot of times, well, even the uh, natural ones, yep. but they're community ones. It's You're going to see 20 community ones before you find a, a dominant, like his own yeah. scrape. And so I've put cameras on some of these, and you're going to get the smaller little basket racks and things like that. But it's it takes a little effort to find like a big dominant buck scrape where it's his. In most of the spots where there's good pinch points, you know, that's typically where you find a good community scrape, too, is where there's a good pinch point because right. all the he's deer come, are funneling you're, through you're coming there out anyway. a thick hemlock or there's yep. a swampy border. Again, we're back to the pinch point and the bottlenecks. So there's pro- yeah. probably, I would have to guess, within, you could probably see a community scrape from most of your ladder stand locations, if I had to guess. Yeah, if there happens to be one there and uh, it just doesn't seem to get any bigger it's, it's just that one size yeah yeah so you can tell it's just what's in the the natural deer that live right around that area yeah what else what else do you guys like to hone in on what are some some tips maybe that you guys do that uh that leads to getting big bucks every single year just maybe a little uh, little uh, tip that you can think of my hobby hunt in the same couple of miles of area over the years but i just always came like branch out just you know you always think you can find something better Mm -hmm. and that's what i would tell somebody new that asked me a question okay if you hunted a spot this year and you didn't see any deer well where are you going next year and then they'll say same place (laughs) why branch it out do a little scouting do go in the winter for a walk or in september you know pick a day go for a couple hour walk yeah you're going to get sweaty it's warm out but so what? You know, you gotta, you gotta always keep adding to your arsenal, so to speak. You can't just have like three spots and beaten trail going to all three. You gotta yep. move around, take them out, leave them alone. I've got a stand that I just redid last year, that I took down in 2015, and I just put it back last year, and I could have shot a small buck there, and my son passed up another one, small one, same stand, and I was getting good pictures just obviously the wind was wrong for us to be there or you know not quite legal yet early or late but it was a good spot but i hadn't been there for years yeah and i've had some that are just dead where i've just said i'm tired of maintaining this stand pull them move them put them somewhere else so you got to be versatile yeah, don't don't get too attached to a spot. Correct. Yeah, right. L- L- Lanny always likes to say that uh, you, if you just got to hunt where the deer are. If you're if you're doing the same thing every single year and you're not getting deer, you're just not hunting in the right, right spot. You got to change your. You might find a fantastic spot where you shoot a nice buck. Yep. Okay. Next year, your curiosity or the camera's gonna tell you. You'll get one, so you'll have a spot that's good for two or three years. It's gonna die out. Yep. So you can't keep burning that candle. You've got to move. Or just leave it alone and just yeah go back to it maybe check keep tabs on it yeah exactly recycle your spots a little bit right what kind of uh what kind of rattle and horns do you use do you use a big shed set do you use i use a black rack 
You do. Use a straight up black rack. Hmm. Yep. They they fold together nice and they fit in my backpack because I carry one backpack. It's pretty streamlined and I put everything I need in it. I like to have everything right there. So when I take it off, you know, I've got my scents in, in certain pockets. I got my black rack. My I got. <laughs> It sounds so over like zealous, but I have a grunt tube on my around my neck, but I have like ten different grunt tubes in my backpack, literally, because to me they all sound different. You yeah. know, they're all some are flexible, some aren't, um, and I just I like to switch it up. So you cycle through them throughout the day. Yeah, it depends on the, the type of deer I'm hunting. If I'm hunting a real aggressive deer, then I want to have a really really deep bellowy grunt tube. Um, and then it also depends on the time of the season, you know, if it's, uh, the very beginning of the rut or the chase phase, I should say, yep. I'm actually going to use a grunt tube that sounds more of a, I'm an immature buck yeah. because that's going to piss off a bigger buck and make him think, oh, wow, this is a smaller buck chasing around a doe. Yep. And I will do, you know, the, the, um, grunt sequence will be repetitive, you know, brat, 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 sounding like it's chasing. But if you do that with a deep tone grunt and another bigger buck hears it he actually may be intimidated depending so the lower you use during that in my opinion during that point in time the better your odds are you know and then when we get deep into the rut towards you know the latter end and and i got a lot of bigger deer now because most of the smaller bucks at this point have learned their lesson they're out of the game they've had their ass kicked now we're switching to, to a deeper toned grunt tube because it's going to be you know mature after mature buck that so, makes sense you know and then that's how it's worked for me up to this point in time and all these grunt tubes sound different they might sound good to you but to a deer it to be high too high pitch too low you know too it's, dominant or just sometimes i'll actually use two grunt tubes at a time yep I'll grunt. To sound like two different deer right there. Or the same deer has different tones, and it's hard to get different tones with that one tube. Even if you blow it different, it still has that same monotone. <clears throat> yeah. You know, and it's just like humans. Every human's voice sounds different. And honestly, it's like, I don't know, I've never heard a grunt tube that really sounds like the grunts that you hear. You it doesn't. When and, you and, hear. and they don't care. And, and honestly, when you blow in that grunt tube, I've blown in them so hard that they actually squeal at the end. It doesn't matter. It will not affect it. The deer will still come to that and investigate it. You know. Yeah, they're curious at the end of the day. They're exactly. If it has any inkling that it's another buck, it's coming in. And if you've got a gun in your hand, like, so, I'm mostly probably ninety percent of my hunting that these days is bow, maybe eighty percent and twenty percent with a gun. Yeah. It's you sometimes got to play it a little bit differently because I've noticed I've noticed a lot. Um, in my sequences, I can get a mature buck to come to 60 yards or 50 yards away, but he never, he doesn't get it. it. Sometimes, yeah, but if you get one that runs, like you said, I haven't had that yet where they just charge right in on me. <laughs> I haven't had that yet. Um, but, you know, I'm sure it's just the, you got to find the buck with that personality. Yeah, it's that buck at that <clears> time. <throat> but, like, all those other big bucks that I called in to 50 or 60 yards that kept that buffer and then turned away. I couldn't get them to come closer. They'd be dead if I had a gun right, in my hand. So, like, smoked, yeah. if you have a gun in your hand, I feel like you're, you you can afford to be more aggressive, too. That's you know? kind of where I was saying, like, the setup is important because there's been multiple times, I'm sure, where I've called, and I've had a mature buck come within that 60-yard range, and I never even knew he was there. Mm -hmm. And then once he figured out something just isn't right, they just creep on off. They don't run. They don't make any noise. They're just gone. Yeah. You know? So... I mean, I want, if I had to tell anyone anything, I think the most important thing is to, um, you know, once you find a spot in the woods and you, you figure out where a mature buck lives and you figure out what deer do, carry that with you wherever you go. Because I don't care what piece of woods you are in, all deer hide, live, eat, sleep, and breathe in the same type of woods, no matter where you are. So... Like I said earlier, dead woods. All you have to do is eliminate the dead woods from where the deer are traveling. Once yeah. you find that out, then you put yourself in a good good predicament to shoot something. What do you say to uh, how do you, how do you identify dead woods? If you had to 
if you had to describe it to like the beginners like probably like too open yeah. uh, really no mass crop nothing to eat yeah, no shelter it's just those open yeah you know yeah i mean it, open whippy stuff that's just like just straight leaves wide open and you can almost tell because there's no other animals there either. Yeah, it's almost like the nicer the view. It's just exactly. It's like that. You don't want to be if there. If you're not seeing squirrels, if you're not hearing birds, it, there's not going to be deer because they all tend to feed on the same type of you know mass crop, which is acorns and other things like that. And you need some wetness. You need some hills. You need places for them to hide. Deer don't want a flat, straight, wide open area. Yeah. You know, with nothing there. Um, and there are just certain places in the woods where deer just, they just don't go there. There's no need to travel. There's nothing to eat. And you want to avoid that at all costs. It's a good point though, too, that, uh, to squirrels are, you know, as annoying as they can be. If you see, if you're in a spot and you start seeing squirrels, they're there cause there's acorns or exactly. some kind of a nut. Yep. So, you know, it's for, for a real beginner who, who might be just looking for deer and, they're trying to hone in on deer sign. Maybe a beginner walking start through the woods, you squirrels. start seeing yep. some squirrels. squirrels, partridge, turkeys. Yeah, they're all pretty much eating almost the same thing. Yep, yep. Just focus in on that, and uh, yeah, because I, I can't tell you how many times I've been super annoyed, and so have all of us by by squirrels. But you're right. If you're in the if you're in the area where all the squirrels are, you're you're in the game for deer too. Man, same thing with the squirrel sound. I mean, those things have helped me. <laughs> Let me know those deer coming. I can't even tell you how many yeah, times. Because yeah, like just, a, like a free just as much as they bark at you, they bark at deer going by. So mm-hmm. if you start hearing red squirrels and blue jays, more importantly, in the distance going off, you know it's time to start keeping your eyes Every open. time I hear blue jays, yeah, I mean, you're always thinking, all right, here comes some deer. It's something, something's then making a happens. disturbance. Yeah, most of the time it's not, no. but it's... The, you never know. Yeah, you never know. It's got to start getting ready, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What else? What about uh, what about summer? How, how how do you guys do much summer location scouting or summer camera or anything like that? Or not really, <laughs> honestly. I mean, from at the end of turkey season, I pretty much stay out of the woods for the next couple months. I I go back in usually the end of July and into August because I do want to plot a few areas. But this is an expanded now, yeah. not my regular rifle areas. I don't even go near for for a long time. Honestly, most of my rifle spots, like I say, I I go by history. And yeah. Right. If the landscape hasn't changed, there's no buildings, there's yep. nothing. It should stay pretty much the same. Yep. And it has since I, since I've been ten, I've had the you know the possibility to shoot a buck at most areas I hunt since then every year. So there's no need for me to change that. Mm-hmm. You know. Like he said, unless you're going to pull up in your spot and there's you know trucks there that uh, people are hunting or whatever, then I go to my next spot. But you know if nothing's changed, then, then we we stay right with it. But as far as yeah, as far as scouting in the summer, I I personally don't go in the woods till till it's getting closer to uh, expanded, and that is to um, go ahead and start hanging some of the mock scrape yeah, vines that I was mocks. telling you about. Oh yeah, so I was gonna say, so you just uh, um, obviously you look for trees with natural licking branches, you know, that are the height of you know a deer's nose, and you know four four to six feet tall, right? But when you're hanging, what kind of tree are you? What kind of limb are you hanging your vine from? I try, I try to hang it from a. um, Lose my train of thought. A fir tree of, of sorts. A hemlock. A hemlock. Because yep. deer love to make scrapes under hemlocks. That's my ultimate. So like, kind of like a, not, not not like a mature hemlock, like, a, you know, the 10, 12 footers? No, thing. yeah. Something probably with a six inch diameter yeah. tree. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's, it doesn't matter if the branch is flexible. You just want don't want it to snap. So yep. if, if it's yep. something pretty healthy. And then I like to make it... Um, I don't put it right on a deer run, but I like to have it within like six to ten yards of a deer run. Deer can see vines. They actually, they know, I don't, I don't know how, but they know to go to that. Yeah. For some reason, it just looks different, and they can see the scrape from their trail. So I usually put it off that trail a little bit. And the reason I do that is because <clears throat> when deer are coming down a trail, they're just moving along, moving along, moving along. Well, if I have my licking branch and mock scrape off to the side... 
it'll force a buck to stop and turn and, and go check that out. If I'm in my stand, that's a perfect opportunity for my for me to get myself ready, pick my gun up or my bow, and put an arrow in him. Oh, yeah, that's true. Well, they're not just going. Then he's not just got his head no. beeline moving along, and I don't have to rant stop him. Mm-hmm. He's going to go to that. He's going to go to that scrape I made. Yep. He's going to start doing his thing, and it's going to give me ample opportunity to get ready yep. and draw on him. Um, and sometimes I've, I've even uh, found recently, too, that if you put something, like you can put mineral out and corn and stuff here until, you know, a couple weeks before the deer season, you got to remove it. I don't know what it's like in Maine, but I like to do that in the summer it. to get, get, get does, you know, even the doe, pregnant, pregnant does, it helps them uh, have a healthier, you know, uh, get the right nutrients for right. for their fawns and stuff. But I, if you put it right in their trail, it almost annoys them, you know. Yes, it's like, exactly. Don't, don't, don't dump the shit right in their trail. Like, put it off yep. because then they're like, huh, this is normally not here. We've been using this trail for years and years yeah. and something's off, you know. Exactly. But if you put it off to the side, it doesn't seem to annoy them as much, you know. So it gets hit more. Probably the same thing with your licking branches. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I've actually done it in the very beginning where I put it on the deer trail, um, and they actually started making a new trail around it. They didn't want anything to do with it. It was too odd. Yep. Um, but then I started to learn to put it off the trail. You know, between like I said, six and ten yards, and now there's a there's a trail coming off, cutting right to that thing, and then they'll loop back to their main trail afterwards. So, I mean, they're, they're weird like that. And uh, I've had times where I wanted to divert them to go somewhere else. And just I cut a tree right over their trail, and it will divert them directly wherever you need them to. I mean, deer are easy to corral if you need to do so, you know, if you're allowed to. Yeah. Don't be cutting trees unless you're told you can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What I've seen where I hunt, let's say if there's a lot of undergrowth where sitting on the ground is not a good option because you can't see. So you find the right tree to put a stand in, but the run is just just still too far. Well, that's when you can get in and if you nipped off a few trees, mm-hmm. if you can, uh, then they'll hopefully divert closer to you rather than opposite. But yeah, little things like that can make all the difference. You don't put and up a sign? Very minimal. I tried that. And go that work. way. Yeah, come this way. Yeah. 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 I've, I've got an acre and a half behind my house. That's it. But I bought, when I bought my house, there was an acre and a half back there that was landlocked and nobody, you know, none of the neighbors owned it. So I was like, what's going on here? I reached out to that guy. He ended up selling me that, selling it to me and I can actually hunt it. So perfect. And yeah, like I played a little bit with uh, moving some of the down trees that are there and just trying to funnel the deer in a certain certain way still still playing with it it's a small area to try to do that but that's where that becomes important you know funneling them right right by your stand if you can there's some good bucks that go back there um but i i only hunted it really that first year the last two years like we like you guys said you kind of the grass is always greener you you're always going further away from home it seems like oh it's amazing i mean i have some of the best hunting ever right behind my house and i'm like in another town yeah it's crazy yeah because there's something about it, I think. Yeah. If the bucks back there survive, then you know, like, oh, they're su- great. Now I get to keep tabs on them. I see them <laughs> yeah. get really, really big. Um, so it's like, yeah, you kill a big one elsewhere, you're saving your local big ones to get even bigger. I don't know. Yeah. That's how I kind of look at it. But, yeah, we've been doing it for, uh, about an hour and a half now. So I think we're, unless you guys have any parting words. or You guys are coming to Huntstock, right? What's going on with that? Um, we're, we're definitely going to be there to visit regardless, but we're thinking about actually uh, setting up over there. Um, yep. I know you said you probably still have a little bit of room left. So, yeah. Yep. Um, we'll probably talk to you offline about that and see if we can't get a table set up. Yeah, dude. Bring up some of the heads and let you guys check out some of the bucks we've killed and maybe talk some stories. Yeah, I would love to see some of those monsters, man. So, yeah, that would be uh, that would be something I'd look forward to doing. Northeast Big Buck Club has their has their display wall there. So if you guys did bring, you can if you set up your own booth, you can obviously put them in put them on yours. But they have their wall that they build, and um, you can display them there as well. If you guys decide not to set up a booth or whatever, you okay. can display them inside. Or um, there is always a possibility that it could rain. It's an outdoor event, so that, you know making sure that you've got you know a tent, the right tent, and your your animals are safe in case a rainstorm comes rolling through. You know what I mean. <laughs> 
<laughs> you, you always yep. want to think about that. That's true. That's true. So, but yeah, whether we're uh, whether we're at a, actually at a table or not, we'll definitely be there to visit. But I'd like to come up and and try to get something going and talk to everyone, have get some stories and yep, I mean show some deer off and yep, that's a great experience, like that. man. Yep. That, that's what it's all about there. People get to walk from like basically a little deer camp to deer camp. You know, yeah, talk that's, to that's what I'm talking Different that. hunting groups. You can't beat that. That's awesome. Everybody's there with open arms. You want to yeah. talk to new people. You know, it's uh, it's a it's a cool cool experience. So I hope you guys do make it down. Perfect. I really appreciate you having yep. us on today. And Nate too. I'd like to meet Nate. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah, you'd enjoy meeting him. Yeah. He's got a lot of stories to tell too. You guys hungry? A little bit, yeah. We're always hungry. <laughs> Matsi always take a free meal. We've got it. We've got a. Uh, we've got a um, Brazilian all you can eat. Well, it's a buffet. Great meats and stuff right around the corner. We can go grab something quick if you guys want to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll do that. Cool, absolutely, awesome. Matsi said he was going to pay for us to eat, so well, that's, <laughs> what, that's what I need to talk to you about. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys for coming. That was yeah, great. Man, much appreciated. Yeah, thank that you. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. And I think Pleasure. the listeners are going to have a lot of awesome thing there's a lot of new stuff that hadn't been brought up before in that in this podcast so sometimes the podcast you talk about a lot of the same stuff but this one had a lot of great things that i haven't heard yet on on the podcast and this is episode 94 so i think uh it'll it'll do really well and uh you guys will have a lot to uh think about perfect perfect thanks guys thank you